Skinwalker Ranch 2018 meeting that took place where Kirkpatrick was present. And even Fugel, like, I, I thought it was really, you know, cool of him to be transparent and, like, post that picture. But then he mentioned the video to me. And so I went back into the Green Street interview where he, where he interviewed him. And, you know, regardless of what you think of Green Street, I think to get that information out of Fugel of, like, the details, some of the details from the meeting and how, um, you know, the, the process and, and it actually took place was interesting. I think that once once Fugel mentioned that there was a video of the full meeting and he's, he's talked about it again, that I think he said like a lawyer, like just f for their, you know, protection purposes recorded it. And I actually reached out in a DM to Fugel and, you know, talked to him a little bit. I was like, look, man, I'm not trying to criticize you because I came kind of hard. I was like, yo, we, we need that fucking video, dude. Like that to me, if there's a recording of Kirkpatrick saying, like stopping the meeting like he said and it, it, it he didn't say that so he said that kirkpatrick was one of the uh he mentioned in the meeting that there were a bunch of people and that somebody stood up and said uh you know before you go into it we already acknowledge the ufo uap phenomenon as being real and then green street said that through his other source he said that that person who said that was kirkpatrick and so Fast forward to now, and he posted the um, picture of Kirkpatrick at the Arrow meeting, or not the Arrow meeting, but the meeting, the 2018 meeting, where basically Skinwalker Ranch was making a presentation to the staffers and 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 people who uh, you know were there to listen to it. And Kirkpatrick was one of the people in attendance. So do that, you know, that's who, do you know who invited uh, Kirkpatrick? He said one of the staffers invited him uh, to to be present in the meeting and he you know it, like like i think people were like he didn't acknowledge that he was there he he kind of did acknowledge he was there he was like yeah it was a continuation of a tip and osap so that to me was right too because if you if you look at what who owned skinwalker ranch at the time and you know we i kind of put this timeline together once i started looking into this is basically like OSAP ATIP ended not officially, but nobody knows really officially around like 2012 or so. And then, you know, Kona Blue comes out there, which is like sort of like maybe their next pitch of the continuation of the program. It doesn't get accepted. And then there's like a sort of like a four or five year period where nobody, it's kind of like nobody really knows what was going on behind the scenes. And then now we have this 2018 meeting where before with a tip was bigelow bigelow owned it and they were you know bigelow was the one that was in control of like uh, letting people come on skinwalker ranch and study it and gathering data and then it was transferred to fugal so to me this 2018 meeting was fugal's pitch to basically be like yeah you guys should come back to the ranch i have a lot of equipment i've got it outfitted with a bunch of this stuff like we're researching it this could be an opportunity to study it in, in a, in a more uh, detailed way with, with gathering more data and using some of this technology that's been developed. And um, so I think that the thing for me was, uh, is not in question of like Kirkpatrick was there. And, and I think the one thing that a lot of people are debating online is the capacity at which Kirkpatrick took the, or was knowledgeable or even aware of the UFO topic. And um, also whether or not he said that about he stopped the meeting. So if Kirkpatrick stood up in the middle of a meeting before he took the job at Arrow and he was like, listen, guys, we already acknowledge that UFO um, phenomenon is being real. Boom. To me, that's smoke. That's a smoking gun. That's that to me debunks and 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 goes right flies right in the face of everything Kirkpatrick and Arrow have stood for. But we, we, I, I can't personally take Brandon Fugel at his word that that happened without seeing the video evidence. I just can't. I, 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 I don't know why I can't. But some people in the community have gone to that conclusion to say that that has happened. And I think to me, it frustrates me because now we're, now we're getting to this like asymmetric thing that Gary Nolan mentioned of like being able to make conclusions based off of evidence and not digging into more evidence to make those conclusions. And so it's, it's kind of like, I wish that people would really dig into like, let's get this video. But instead they're like, Oh, we don't need the video. Uh, we've got enough to make the conclusion that Kirkpatrick's just lying about the whole thing. So that's kind of one of the things that's, that's frustrated me a little bit with this and why I've been like digging into it is like, 
I, I would like to see this really flushed out to see, you know, what, what, what capacity was Kirkpatrick there, how involved he was in the meeting without the video evidence. We're just not going to get a clear picture of that. No, I, I agree with you. And you know what? I, I, I don't trust SK at all in what he puts out, but I will give him the benefit of the doubt for not remembering a meeting because he's obviously been involved with this topic for a very long time and probably had hundreds, if not thousands of these meetings. So if he's going to remember one and just because it's Skinwalker Ranch and Brandon Fuel, there's probably other programs or other areas of study that are that they're putting more money and time into. But as you say, if this is the path of least resistance right now, as I see it, and yeah, I want to see the video. And yeah, you need to understand the context of that meeting to fully understand his involvement in it. And I think it's a key element. Yeah, I mean, to me, if... Kirkpatrick was invited to the meeting, it was most likely because of his mentality and scientific rigor that he take, you know, quote unquote rigor that he takes to the topic. So if he was aware or the staffers in the meeting were basically on the other side and being like, okay, we haven't, fu we're not funding ATIP anymore. We've declined Kona Blue and all of these, you know, proposals that have been put our way to study officially the UAP phenomenon, because keep in mind, like, didn't, we didn't really get anything until the UAP task force was in 2020. So this was in 2018. So they were really trying to like, in my opinion, trying to establish the program again and, and like ways to be able to study this Kona blue used a lot of like the remote viewing stuff and the credibility that was, you know, tied to some of the psychic phenomenon and programs that studied that. So I, to me, they were just really looking at ways to like officially go after some of these programs and, and uh, get some of this crash retrieval information and, you know, uh, our interactions with not human intelligence. And they were just trying to, like, find a, a crack in the shield or, you know, like a way in to, to gather this information. So in 2018, with when Fugel owned the ranch, you know, he was probably seeing a lot of these previous presentations like Kona Blue and being like, ah, it's kind of a shit presentation. Like it wasn't wasn't well put together. It was kind of like very old and vintage looking and and maybe not the best way to present it. So he was probably like, all right, well let's gather some data. I've got a lot of this these this equipment, the money to like study the ranch. Let's gather this data, take these pictures, you know, like and really make a good presentation so that we could, you know, get this program started off again. And um so that, that's why I think the meeting really took place is this was really kind of like a way to get the program possibly going in another direction under Fugel funding it. So, or uh, kind of uh, Fugel initially funding it, but it would go forward being funded under a, a, an official capacity um, for being studied. But it's funny how Skin, really Skinwalker Ranch yeah. is, is, is in the middle. Skinwalker Ranch is always right in the middle, which I find interesting because to me, I don't, I just don't see the phenomenon as being centrally located in one position. Yeah, I agree with you. What about Bigelow? He's kind of gone silent recently, and he's got a lot of information. I like listening to what he has to say on the topic. See, Bigelow to me has shifted. Um, I don't know if it's to more of a skeptic. It's not more of skeptical type of approach, but I think he's gone away from studying things like Skinwalker Ranch and looking for extraterrestrials that are flying around in spaceships in the sky. He's totally shifted to alternate states of consciousness and acquiring information from the future, from channeling, mediumship, precognition, remote viewing. So he's he's funding millions of dollars into projects into that instead of skinwalker ranch and a lot of these other things who he's he's probably spent a lot of money looking at you know i mean look at bigelow aerospace he's he's been able to sort of have the inside track on a lot of the activity in the skies and being able to build uh you know technology and devices for for doing that going up there so i think that he's sort of shifted and been like you know because think about it all it if OSAP and ATIP ended and he was the one that owned Skinwalker Ranch, 
then going forward, like he's probably like, well, they're not going to fund anything. Like I've done all the research that I can. I'm just going to sell it. Well, the interesting part is that Hal Putoff was the main one that was involved in that transition from the sale from Bigelow to um, Brandon Fugel. And he was also at that meeting in 2018. So I don't know what it, it just seems like Hal Putoff is a lot of the times in the background and very much in between a lot of the stuff that's happening. I agree with that point. Has anybody been able to talk to him in any spaces yet? <laughs> no, I don't think probably will. That'd be a legendary space, though. But, you know, same with Kit Green. It's a lot of these figures who are behind the scenes and I think very influential in some of these programs. They're just not coming out publicly. You know, like they, they uh, you know, do a lot of their work on the low don't really maybe want the limelight and, and that sort to um you know because they see what happens to people when they're brought out in public there's so much expectation and uh digging into their credibility and just wanting the next bit of information like squeezing an orange you know how many other hell put us do you know that are out there that are in the background that we don't know right now how many do you suspect handful i would think you know and i think if people were to look into names one of them that's come up recently is like john peterson um who's a name that i didn't know much about but has been very influential in a lot of these programs so it's it's people who are sort of like involved in these programs but they're not really publicly known unless you start digging into some of these connections that are made behind the scenes between some of these so you know, I, I think that that's why I would like to get this meeting. Flood. Like, if we had the whole hour meeting, we could see, like, which who in the room is really, like, interested, who in the room was, like, leading the meeting and, and talking about it and interested in the data that they were presenting and, like, genuinely asking questions and, you know, who was, like, looking off to the side at people who are taking pictures of them. Like, because Kirkpatrick didn't even look like he was fucking paying attention. He looked like, you know, he got caught. He was like, whoa. So, you know, that was just a funny picture that the <laughs> that uh, Fugel decided to post. When you were talking with Fugel, did he say, did you mention to come join in a space and talk about it and let's get the video out? The feeling that I got was that it's the feeling that I got was a lot of what he was saying was to protect his credibility in all of this and not to bring down Kirkpatrick's credibility. And what I got was that the video he, he was hesitant to release. He's been sitting on it for a while because he didn't want to put the other people in the meeting in an uncomfortable position. So, you know, take that for what it is. I still think the power of having Kirkpatrick say that will blow this whole thing wide open and that some of these other guys' feelings, like, they were in the meeting, so they were there. They were present. They knew what was happening. And um, so I, I don't know. I, I feel like the evidence of Kirkpatrick really admitting the UFO phenomenon trumps anything that, you know, uh, anybody's hurt feelings because they were in the video there. Yo, and feel free for anybody else to jump up. Um, we're just having an open discussion. I'd love to uh, find other yeah. people's thoughts about, um, you know, a you lot think of think Fugel's right af afraid for his life right now? Who? Fugel? F yeah. No. No, I don't think so. I think he just posted a, a video of him at the Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> so I don't, I, I think he'll be fine. Yeah, but the you're talking about like the safe thing where he got the uh, USB the the thumb drive stolen from his safe. I mean, I don't really buy that excuse for not showing the video. If he wants to edify himself, he'll do that, right? Yeah, no, I was talking about. He mentioned that like he was in a hotel the night before, and the the thumb drive came up missing. And um, he mentioned that Eric Bard had a backup or, you know, but I think it was just like, damn, like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't take it too much for what it was, but it, you know, thinking about it, who knows what the means people will take, but I, I would have think, 
I would have thought that like if they deleted the whole file off his computer and like completely wiped off his computer, like that to me would would have been a lot more like damn than just like hey, I don't know, a thumb drive going missing, and then he just went to the front desk to report it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how serious a, that is to me, unless you know he already knew what was taking place, kind of then. I saw Garrett jumped up. What's up, dude? Hey, what's up, buddy? Uh, also, man, I wanted to show you some love and tell you congrats on your new opportunity. I saw you got. I think that you're a fucking great dude, and uh, you work really hard. So, respect. Thanks, brother. Um, I had a comment, though, on Fugle, and I saw what you were tweeting about like wanting the video, and I think you have every right to ask for that. I personally disagree that Fugle should have to show anything. I think the ball is back in Kirkpatrick's court and that we should be demanding he tell his story straight. Um, personally, I think uh, you have every right to ask for Fugle, but I think that uh, what you were saying about not going after Kirkpatrick's, like, I don't, I don't think that's a good look for Fugle if he dumps that meeting. And, like, even still, you could claim that it's still out of context because we still don't know the full context. Like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if aspects of this briefing were classified. Um, I'm very fascinated in the part of the story where Fugel says that his drive was stolen. I think that's, like, really freaky, especially if, if aspects of that meeting were classified. I think that's really concerning. And, uh, yeah, dude, I, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that and see if you thought maybe Kirkpatrick should have to answer to this a little more, because I thought that Fugle showing even the glimpse of what we had was like a lot. That was a lot of information. It was, I just don't think we're going to get that from Kirkpatrick though. Like, I just think we're going to get the runaround and I agree not acknowledging, you know, I, I don't think that he's going to be like, you know what? You got me. I was at the meeting. I knew it, you know, like I, I, uh, I think the video and not just for the people in the community, I think like for the, for Congress, you know, people seeing it and be like, yo man, like this whole arrow things of, uh, kind of bullshit. And here's a, here's a big reason why. And just showing that video, like it, and I, I did, I didn't want to be like, I'm pressuring Kirkpatrick to release it. Cause I, I don't want it to, to be framed like that. But I, I, and that's what I told him in DMS is like, look, man, this isn't about you. This is about, uh, the credibility of Kirkpatrick. And I think that video would go a long way to discredit his credibility in this whole thing. And that just asking him about it next time, like I was surprised that green street even got the interview and he did have a couple gotcha moments, which is even why we're even talking about this in the first place. But I don't think Kirkpatrick's going to let that happen again. I mean, what's wrong with releasing segments of the video of just Kirkpatrick? That's what I told him. That, no, honestly, that's what I told him. I said, look, I, I think the best thing would be just to crop that part and then to crop everybody out but Kirkpatrick speaking. And then nobody knows anybody else that's that's even in the room other than Kirkpatrick just speaking and, and saying that one quote. It, to me, it was it's just about that one quote, the acknowledgement of the UFO topic, because everything that he said publicly we, would go against it. That's exactly, uh, that's all you need. What's that, a 15 second clip at the most? But yeah, but Kirkpatrick seemed to be on this like media blitz, this, this really this whole year. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like coming up, there's going to be a nice punch back from the Elizondo book, the Grush uh, op-ed, and James Fox documentary is is just some publicly things that I think people know about. But I do think there's going to be, and there's I've been a couple articles that have come out to really refute it. Of course, Chris Mellon's thing on Arrow, but you know I think people are really looking for a strong kind of like resistance to everything that Kirkpatrick has been has been talking about because he's he's been media even while he's not been with arrow he's been completely retired off of the arrow topic he's really been going even harder on some of these uh podcast conferences and, and appearances to talk you know more he's like digging in his his feet even more in what he's been saying good bob what's up hey man how you doing 
chilling. Uh, uh, so Carl Nell is also going to be interesting, right? Yeah, I heard of that today. I didn't know too much about the presentation. Did do you have the details of like what it's going to be about? Or I think it was like a panel he was mentioned on. Yeah, it's about non-human intelligence, and I think he's going to do something similar to what he did at Seoul. Maybe he's going to get some new information to the pe people, but that's not a bad replacement, right? Hell no, that's a good one. Uh, I wanted to point out something about the Skinwalker Ranch because. I noticed that Paul's portal is here, and he's going to have Danny Sheehan on the 24th on a space. And I, I spoke to Danny about a month ago, and I asked him about the ranch because um, well, I'm, I'm I've never been like I've never taken a deep dive into it per se, and I wanted to know his opinion on what he thinks the ranch is. And it was very curious to me that he. He said there are two different things. One thing is the ranch, and he says that the disclosure process of ETs is a different thing, and they should be considered in different um, lanes. I found that very interesting. Why do you guys think he said it like that? Or uh, I, Because I've never really gotten the connection, the full connection uh, from the ranch to this whole disclosure process, but when everything went down last week, I was like, okay, so it is connected. What's up, Paul? I saw you uh, jumped up here too. Feel free to jump in the combo, man. Sorry, I was just uh, cleaning up a poop diaper. Fun stuff. Sheesh! <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> I, I think you know, over. Yeah. <laughs> no man, I won't uh, I won't interrupt you. That's important stuff. <laughs> I think you know, Skinwalker Ranch to me is a very is is a huge uh point of emphasis where in terms of research that's been done to it, whether it was under Bigelow or um Fugel, you know, I just wonder now as it's transitioned to the T V show, it, you know, like how is that going to work in to the actual study of it? Because um, you know, a lot of the complaints about the show is that they're not very transparent about the data that's being released. You know, it, it's same with Bigelow. Like you can look at Bigelow. Bigelow is sort of like this like data hoarder <laughs> where he's got these databases and he had access to MUFON and, you know, the, the, the means to be able to like acquire some of this information and data through him being a billionaire and uh, but but not really being transparent and sharing at all. And the same goes to Bigelow's project that he's doing right now with the Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies. He was supposed to last year in August release the names of the researchers and projects that were looking into the you know this like uh, consciousness avenue of acquiring future information. And so far, like. They're almost a year. Shit, they're almost a year late in posting any information on it. And he I already know two of them, man. If you care to know, who uh, two of the projects? Two of the people who are working on these projects. Oh yeah, hell yeah! I've heard of a couple, but yeah, f feel free. Yeah, let us know. One of them is Nick Cook. I talked to him on my podcast, and he also got a position on on Bigelow's uh, Institute. And the other one is the winner of the contest that. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlov. Oh, the near-death uh, experience essay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know another program within the Monroe Institute that's also funded that has to do with the group of lucid dreamers. So, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, super interesting. I would love to find, like, that's, you know, it's not about calling them out, but I would just love to know what actual studies and projects are being done to acquire this information. To me, that's extremely interesting. Go ahead, Rich. What's up, dude? Yeah, I just want to make a comment here. I'm not. I'm not a skeptic at all. I'm not even a believer. I'm a knower. I know it's real. I don't know what it is. That's all I know. It's. I know it's real. But with Fugel, to me, the video is very important because I want to see that. I want to know the context of that. And yeah, it's just for Patrick. That's great. If he doesn't. It almost feels like to me it's him promoting the show, the TV show with this. So I'm, 
Am I skeptical about Fugle? Am I skeptical about Kirkpatrick? And maybe both, right? But if Fugle can prove with a video, then okay, then it's 100% not a promo for a show, in my view. I could be wrong, but that's how it makes me feel. That's fair. Yeah, I can respect that too. One of the things that I really appreciate about Fuel is basically his transparency. I mean, we've had a space with Jason Sands, right, for like six hours. Fugel had an exact same space just like that. He came on UFO Twitter, jumped on a couple of times, and just answered every question that he's got. And Green Street even jumped in for a space one time <laughs> and, and was asking him questions. So, you know, I, I really do appreciate it, his sort of transparency and activeness to be able to answer a lot of these questions. And, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to have a lot of, like, he'll answer questions from, like, people who are just getting into the topic. So, um, but it's a valid point. I think the entertainment side of it gets people a little bit skeptical about the intentions behind of it. Matthew, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. Hey, uh, I was, I was uh, mo working and trying to listen at the same time. I'm never good at that. So I'm sorry. In advance, if you guys said this, but, you know, with Bigelow coming up and, you know, relevant to the ranch and everything else you guys are talking about, I, every time Bigelow comes up, I have to bring this up to be in the collective conscience, just bring it back in. And I'm a little bit rusty now because I've got so much going on in life. It's like I was talking about this, about Bigelow, this specific thing I'm about to mention recently in the last months, and I could, I could have recited more ex explicit details and verbatim quotes from him, but so I'm, for, for some reason I'm blanking out. I can just give you the gist of what he has said in a couple of interviews over the last, I think it was just in the last couple of years, those rare podcast type interviews he did. And he has, one way or another, it, I don't even think it required too much reading through the lines, but he's effectively, you get the feeling through the things he said more directly and some things he said a little less directly, but you can't help coming away uh, from the conclusion, with the conclusion that he is against disclosure is against the public knowing what he knows and having the data he has or in, in the general sense being that you know we can't handle it something to that effect i just can't remember ex exactly what he said explicitly i just think that's important like i don't think you can talk about bigelow without bringing that up and and, and pro properly informing the context of anything that has to do with him so i just want to mention that maybe some of you guys maybe you astral remember more explicitly what it was he said now in those relatively more recent interviews because i'm drawing a blank i just know for a fact that was the gist of it. I mean, no doubt about that. Go ahead, Pavel. And uh, feel free, anybody else, to jump in the chat. We're just hanging. Okay. And um, uh, you know, talking some good stuff. I think that what uh, Bigelow means is that, I mean, we're on UFO Twitter. We talk about this all the time, right? But compared to the world's population, it's just like a small percentage of people who are interested in this topic. And I think that what Mr. Bigelow means when he says that is that people just want to carry on living their lives as they are right now, and they don't really want any type of paradigm-shifting uh, moment that disrupts their way of life. And... I think in a sense that's true because uh, just imagine the shock that it would be for someone who is not even aware of any of this uh, and just get all that information just dumped on them like that. Uh, how would they feel and what? how would the shock be? Uh, the ontological shock. And I think that's the majority of humans. I think that's uh, along the lines of what I understood Mr. Bigelow means by this you know and also uh there's a lot of tech that could be created uh, with the information that is being kept from us that could be extremely dangerous for humanity and i also see that uh national or international security standpoint uh of not disclosing everything Yeah, it's like controlled disclosure versus catastrophic disclosure. Which what, what would you prefer? <laughs> I don't know, man. I think disclosure hap it is a very personal experience, and it happens to 
uh, it's happened already to a lot of us, you know, and this disclo this general disclosure uh, to all the people, I don't think it's realistic, to be honest with you. Go ahead, Matt. Well, yeah, I just thought I'd reply real quick. I mean, yeah, we can have, you know, 10 years of conversations about the why for those who advocate for some level of secrecy. Uh, and so that's not really, I mean, yeah, that's a whole other deep question that's been going on, depending on who the particular secret keeper in question is or which faction it is over the decades. And lots of things to say about that. But I was just, I think it's, you know, which is fine, but I was just more so making the prior point as to uh, about Bigelow, I mean, because that's something can be made of that, including the things you're talking about, Powell. But uh, I, I just think it's particularly, you know, even prior to getting into those, you know, the background and the, the whys for that, why am I think that I just think it's a significant data point that he was someone who started out on the outside, just had some money and uncovered some truths and has, you know, found himself becoming... But, you know, in, you know, I don't imagine he set out with that mindset, you know. But uh, here it is, you know, some years, couple of decades later, after investing and uncovering some information, he's become, if not a, a gatekeeper, a secret keeper. So I just think that's uh, important. And, and then, if you want to back more, my own reflection on what you're saying is, like, I don't care. I think this is human rights. I think this is natural law of the highest order, that you do not... You know, this is, people probably get hard, tired of me saying this, but I don't care what the consequences are. Truth will always set you free. And uh, if, if living in the in awareness of our, our true reality is our undoing, then we're not supposed to be here. And that sucks to hear. But that's just a foundational bedrock ethic, moral first principle. You know, that's why I go on, on, on and on about it because me is kind of my pet peeve that, you know, the worst thing you could ever do is uh, hide information about uh, your fellow man's nature, the nature of his reality from him. That's like the highest of high crimes, the most cruel thing you could do, in my mind. And, uh, I mean, I don't care if I can handle it or not. Living a, living a lie to the, you know, to the nth degree, like, nothing could be worse than that. You couldn't do anything worse to another human being. So, anyway, that's my own additional commentary on uh, what you said, likely you're true. You know, that's surely what people like Bigelow think. But, uh, you know, somehow he got converted, I suppose, which is back to my original point, an interesting uh, data point worth reflection. To be clear, I agree with you. Uh, I was just stating what I think they think. And people in the DOD and many of the, uh, like Lakatsky and Dr. Kelleher and all those people, they think the same way. They don't want everything disclosed. Uh, but I, don't, I think like you, I, I think it's a human right. Uh, to know this. Amen to that, brother. Appreciate you. Yeah, I wonder what was part of that shift, too, for him. Because it does seem like he shifted from physical ETs, UFOs, to this, like, sort of esoteric, psychic, parapsychology type of approach to... Um, you know, getting information from alternate states of consciousness and then, uh, you know, see, and it, it was specifically to basically like see like in 10 or 15 years, if there were any catastrophic events that were taking place and using people who are intuitive to, to crowdsource that information. So he's basically like paying all the mediums and channelers in the world, taking that information of 5,000 accounts, scrubbing it with AI and being like, oh, well, 30% of the people say that there's going to be a tidal wave or a meteor or a volcano or, you know what I'm saying? And so he's looking at that because I, I do think there's some legitimacy to it, but he's actually like spending the money to, to gather this data, which is very interesting, which is why I'd like to see <laughs> some of these projects that are being built. There's another version of this in Spain. Uh, it's an author named Jose Juan Benitez, and he claims to have contact with NHI since the 70s, and he's been writing books about a lot of different stuff, and it's very similar to what uh, Mr. Bigelow has switched to, like the consciousness aspect, and Benitez also talks about um, this time-traveling hypothesis that 
Dr. Michael Masters wrote in his book of the extratempestrial model. And this guy has been talking about uh, many similar stuff since the 70s. So you find that fascinating. Saw info jumped up. What's up, brother? Hope everybody's feeling blessed. I was just going to say, Matthew has a really good point about, like, the truth has set you free. But it's that truth being one version of a truth isn't exactly true for the whole world. Like, it's, uh, I don't mean it against his statement. It's, it doesn't represent every culture. There's 7 billion people representing a quantified number of cultures, and those cultures sometimes never even want to know the truth and also consider things not for them and their, but they consider the next generations. And I'm not saying that as if it's correct. It's just, it's why it's maybe we're, it's like listening to you guys talk about Brandon's shift in the consciousness. I, I've never listened to it from the outside. And you guys, um, I think like, what if preparing people to just be okay with themselves is the start? And we're nowhere near that. Um, you know, so because what happens with the truth too could be quantified resentments, entrenched beliefs. And so the risk isn't worth, the juice isn't worth the squeeze is what it seems like at this point right now. And I don't know what the answer is to that, if that's good or bad, but it's, it's just what it looks like from, from when everything you guys say to everything that's happening. When you look at it from a global aspect, like global, it's, it's, a, it's a serious word if you get the 7 billion people. And we get like obsessed with like how we want it. That's nothing against you, Matt. I, I feel that sometimes heavy but it's um then when you quantify it and you speak to people from a culture like i don't want to go over them but some of them like i don't want to fucking know or they represent a whole people that don't want to know things so it's kind of how i look at it now i've been chilling out and when i hear you guys talk about how people are pushing more people towards consciousness and these media things i don't know i've had an experience recently where i've introduced a lot of people to monroe's institute expand app it's on itunes and I always look like a clown, because I, 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 they'll be like, oh, how do you seem so chill about all these weird things? I'm like, I don't really do much, I, you know, and I mention it, and then, so 15 people I've shown this to are like really douchey, never, don't even like UFOs, worth a lot of money, like, at first they always look at me like a joke, and then they like get the app, and then they, most of these people still use this Monroe Institute consciousness app. And I think that's why when I hear you guys and I, and I know my experience with introducing people to this shit and I don't really sell it. I'm just like, Hey, try it, man. I don't fucking, it's my personal thing I use. You don't fucking want it. That's your choice, you know? And, um, so yeah, consciousness and, and helping people understand themselves is probably the start before telling them like, you're not alone everywhere. And we're nowhere near people being okay with themselves at all. I love that, man, because those are those real life conversations, bro, that I've gone through for years of like not I, I, it's kind of like gone through a, a shift to where I'm not trying to convince anybody anymore. Like I'm not trying to throw some stuff or to like bombard you with this topic so that you get interested in it. I'm just on my journey and I'll mention it here and there. But you know, if you are interested in it, you know who to come to, to get more information. And, and here's some ways that you can experience it yourself. But I think that's a great approach to have because it, it, it almost turns some people off when you keep on or like, yo, you got to look at this. You got to look at that. You got to look, you know, and I think people being genuinely interested in this topic themselves and then exploring it is, is a really important thing. Yeah, that's cool. I'm happy to be here. Hey, I just got a, reply real quick to what you were just saying there l info cipher uh yeah i mean i'm with you actually i mean gosh that's part of my own awakening there's many layers and levels to it but man when you start to encounter the degree to which not to belittle anybody or trivialize how complicated and amazingly complicated it all is but the degree to which the average person is asleep and even willfully asleep as opposed to you know just the simple metaphor of asleep versus awakening you know that's its own new level or layer like oh my gosh well what it's like you know like astral saying i don't you know you can't you can't make people be interested in expanding their consciousness again to use another 
<laughs> expression that's probably means so much can mean so many different things and can mean so much but it just at a base way of describing it um yeah so i you know i agree with everything you're saying as well i just like to remember our our these sort of these philosophically uh, grounded bedrock grounded moral first principles that kind of guide us and i think you know i think uh like I said, if you're just if you're not committed to the truth, then you're, you're going to lose your way every time. And I think, you know, I'm of the mind that different factions over the decades of just regular old humans, never mind the NHIs they've been encountering and dealing with and trying to uh, comprehend and assess and uh, discern, uh, you know, even just regular old humans have probably had the opportunity or been given the task even. I'm, I'm very open to this, and I might even, if I had to place bets, I'd probably bet that they were, some of them have been encouraged to try to start facilitating our collective sort of awakening, if you will, and it's like they just decided to play it safe maybe because they're afraid, and I think fear, again, is one of those to get all woo and uh, new agey, but it's very true. I think love and fear are kind of the, the polar ends, opposite ends of the spectrum of, uh, uh, of, of kind of a, you know, what all this is warranted around. So, yeah, I mean, for sure, it would be very disruptive, and we probably should have done it a long time ago, and... Who knows what all's really going on? But yeah, I just like to remember what we should be, uh, what our moral first principles are. But for sure, I'm with you. I, and I'm with Astral too. I don't, man. I'm. I still wrestle daily with people's lack of interest. Like I've, that's a that new layer of awakening for me. It's hard for me to accept that people. It's like, wait a minute. What do you mean? Everything's a lie, or everything's not quite what I thought it was, or what I was told. It's like, uh, yeah. It's like that should be like, oh, tell me more. Instead, they're like. Yeah, what's on TV? <laughs> That's hard for me. It's tough because, like, time. Time is... It's, it's, as you get older, in this room right now... Yeah, I'm looking at the faces. No offense in saying that. I just know a lot of these accounts. You guys understand what I'm saying? As you get older, there's a few different experiences in time. So if your mental health is struggling, it slows down, right? I mean, hopefully, I, not everybody's experiencing that right now. I just have a long time ago... So everything felt like forever. People were like, things are going to be okay soon if you just like relax and let us do this practice, you know, things like that. Then you have success. As people attain success, most people you talk to about it when they're like even very wealthy, they never have enough fucking time. It's going too fast. And as you get older, it's going too fast. But those are all personal experiences. And I'm not, I might not be right here, it's just sharing some shit. And what happens is when you quantify that, amongst a nation and then amongst a c continent and then a, a hemisphere like time slows to a crawl right to be funny with doing it like that and with with that being said <laughs> the world changes at a slow fucking pace and i really think as a poli sci studying kid and most people become nihilist in that sector and everything about my life could become a negative person I just see a lot more efforts towards the truth coming out even at a quant like a state level like even at a, a government level across the world good and bad just everybody's like let's just get the truth out there and even that though takes like 10 or 15 years 20 25 years people are still arguing about let's just release the last documents of JFK's tapes at the top levels right or his records, and, and that's a small example of this huge movement towards the truth, dude, like what you want, but unfortunately, not to be super back to negative, I mean, it's like something we're hoping for, for our, our next kids, you know, or, you know, the next, like, I'm going to be happy if this conversation continues this way, even frugals, everybody's, if you guys really think about it, in 30 years, I mean, we might still be kind of grumpy about it, but it's going to be really cool by then. It, it's actually the it's on an uptick if you like the stocks you'll understand it's always on an uptick it goes down sometimes and holy fuck and then it's like if you spread the spreadsheet out since the 60s it's it's huge it's like apple and so that's the part i'm just saying you know so sorry to over talk but it's it's not getting worse it's just getting better in the sense of information coming out not as quick as we want but it is coming Sorry, I just talked that much. Nah, so bro, you're bringing facts right now. You're spitting fire. It's all good. Appreciate you getting in here. Uh, UFO Mean Girls, what's up? What up, dude? Yo, I don't have too much battery, so I'll try to be quick. Um, info site for man, I missed you. Yo, I missed... Uh, <laughs> That's you. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I missed all the insight you you know used to bring in. Um, I'm going to take the chance to ask you a question. 
because like I haven't gone down this rabbit hole yet. But what can you tell me about James Woolsey and his connection to um, John Peterson from the Arlington Institute? Nothing. Damn, dude. All I know, listen. All I know is Woolsey is a level of a name like Angleton, but I've been so obsessed with James Jesus Angleton and William Colby. Like, I don't change focus, so I, and I would never lie to you, I just know Woosley was a motherfucker, but I can't say much beyond that. Got but it. But I just know he was that motherfucker. Well, so dude, I, him, I believe it. Well, him and Colby were once on the board of the Arlington Institute. Yeah, his name just comes up in a lot of Andy Jacobson's book, and and, and um, Legacy of Ashes and, and every other fucking document. But uh, I got so obsessed with James Jesus Angleton and Colby to this day that I always see Woosley's name and I just, I still don't think even him being attached to them is as big as anything they ever did. It's so weird. But I'm gonna, now you brought it up out for us, I'll do it. I'll, I'll go down that rabbit hole myself. And come yeah, back hell yeah, man. Thanks. I'll send you a couple of stuff, man. I get, yo, um, it's, uh, it's always good to hear from you, man. You always like bring like, just mad CIA shit. <laughs> oh, no, I, I dude, I, not even just that anymore. I've been kind of jumping off of it and taking a break, but yeah, somebody brought up the Good Shepherd again last night, and then I was like, oh, I'm back in it again. <laughs> and what do you know, the Good Shepherd with Matt Damon, which was kind of clowned on when we were kids, but it actually was a serious movie. Robert De Niro was trying to put out the story of James Jesus Angleton, who was probably the most powerful person on earth for a long time, and nobody knew about him. I mean, he wasn't rich. He was just powerful. And anyway, but watch The Good Shepherd and fall into that rabbit hole if you can find stuff on him. Yeah, that's cool, man. Thanks, man. Uh, stick around and watch the uh, the cult takeover of UFO Twitter. It's uh, happening in real time. Oh, man, I don't even know. Yo, you're digging in. All right, what's what's the connection with A-Tip, Skinwalker Ranch, and Arrow, then? Is there is there anything there, Mean Girls? I disavow. What about Hal put off? Give us something. I disavow. Why won't Fulu break from network TV? See, I'm like, I'm just not qualified to talk about any of this stuff, yes. I'm just still, like, you know, in the rabbit hole, so maybe soon. If HBO picked up his show, we would get way more hardcore material. What, Skinwalker? Yeah, yeah. If the, if the corporation needed less cash, I think we would get a little bit more of the drip. I like the Beyond Skinwalker Ranch where they're like going to other places. Have you seen that at all, Info? No, but they need to go to Amityville because I'm obsessed with that since I was They a went kid. to Chris Bledsoe. They outfitted him out with like all this shit and went to his place and had him summon the orbs. Shit. Well, that's an episode I could watch? Yeah. It's uh, their like final episode. It's it's a fucking good episode, dude. It's worth the watch. Just that episode. That's my favorite is Skinwalker Ranch episode. I ha- I don't watch it like that, but that was a really good one. Yeah, that's a uh, to make you guys laugh. I have random episodes of Skinwalkers I buy that you guys recommend. I don't even watch the show. I just buy an episode if somebody recommends it. So needless to say, I will watch that. No, I remember my first uh, episode I watched of Skinwalker Ranch was the last season, the first episode, and it was like this dude went up in the helicopter, was like hanging out of the helicopter, like reading the ground of the Mesa or whatever where the spaceship was supposed to be, and I'm like, God, bro, like, nobody's going to be able to replicate this, you know, <laughs> this probably costs like... 20 30 grand just to have this happen and then at the very end of the episode like the last minute they're like well the data was kind of messed up so we're just gonna scrap this whole thing i'm like damn they didn't even they didn't even get real data i'm like fuck (laughs) um we're supposed to call you ufo mean girls because so anyway (laughs) when are you gonna do your uh vietnam black black helicopters comic book Hey, which one? Nah, the, 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 uh, what is it? Enemy Helicopters Vietnam. Remember I told you? You should do an issue on the enemy helicopters of Vietnam because there was no enemy helicopters. It's just, it was the, the term for UFO. And there's great oh, documents in the right, archive. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, man. Yo, we got to talk. We, we got to link up again because it's been way too long. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
crazy that they that. called it helicopters, though. They called them, yeah, I, was, I think I posted them a long time ago. There's not enough stuff to go deep on, and it was Vietnam, man, but there was no one in the helicopters. So if you saw documents with it, it's like a famous thing that they're, like, either testing stuff, like, on our men, or there was reports of UFOs, and they're like, what? There was even, like, a interaction over, like, a... I don't know the words of bodies of water. I'm not that smart. And it's like fucking, uh, you know, what do they call them? Didn't fans say that they were recovering? <laughs> Jeez, you got a fucking, we just not even used him. <laughs> how, oh, dude. How, <laughs> it's you know, a lot it phone knows everybody, bro. <laughs> Yo, I, I, my ear is trained to listen to people's voices, man. Like, it's okay. It's okay. It's funny. I think it's great. I'm not hating on it. I love it to you, man. Hey, I had I had a gift. I had too much shit on my Twitter. I like get make it less obvious for people who want to egg my house or something. You know, it's got so much better. It's okay, in my opinion. All right, yo, I'm gonna step down. I gotta catch the latest episode of Secrets of Omicron Ranch, but um, I'll catch you guys later. Nice. I was trying to drop the nuggets. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say Jason Sands said. Some of the crash retrievals were in Vietnam. It's nuts. That's by that's. If I'm thinking Vietnam in a, in a in a ship landing in that muck, how the fuck do you get that out with nobody noticing and never getting bombed? Talking about getting in and out fast, right? You'd have to do that. That terrain's not much different than, like, the Everglades. If a ship crashed in the Everglades, I don't know how they get that out, man. They've, they've dropped nuclear weapons in either Georgia or Florida, and it went so deep into the, Ever into the mud that they gave up on them. And those uh, broken arrow stories. Remember that horrible movie with Christian Slater and uh, John Travolta? Damn, I don't want to take it off UFOs, but yeah, you, you'll sidetrack me. My bad. Broken Arrow! Well, that's what, uh, where I live, Western Maryland, and uh, I think it's 65 or 67, they had one, a B-52 cartwheeled across the mountains and two hydrogen bombs rolled out of it. And uh, they had to pick them up. There's a special uh, documentary about it called Buzz one four, and <laughs> to see like news footage of this crash plane on the hills behind my house, it's a little creepy. They said if if these things would have went off, it it would have been destroyed from here to New York City. Yeah, I was obsessed with tracking those or figuring out ways to track the archives to the history of the like those giant trucks they tra transport nukes around because it would take. It's the most ideal. Everybody's brought this up before. Like, if you drive driving around that nuke truck, you, there's could be something else in it, you know? You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever seen a nuke truck? No. Oh, the way they transport nukes in our nation? you never seen that? I'll no. I'll drop the image. Oh, God, this is great, because you literally could hide a UFO in it. There was a, uh, there was a convoy that they cut one-way traffic on a main road out here. And they were transporting something, and they had all these back-to-back, -back, like, Amish-built sheds, except it was, like, four trucks long. And they had the road closed, and it's like, they must have put all these hollow sheds on top of something the whole way through. I'm like, what the hell is that? Are they even moving crash retrievals like that, though, now? They're probably, like, going underground and shit, or whatever. I don't even know if they're still happening. I would feel like it would be too much to be able to be, you know, showed on social media. People would be jumping on it. But they're able to identify it in space and, like, track it all the way down and, like, deal with it within the first, like, 10 minutes of it landing. Yeah, well, I was just curious with Pavel. How, how's, how's like the Nate? Like, are you from Spain? Are you in Spain? No, I live in Tijuana. Oh, uh, Tijuana? Did you just say Tijuana? Yes. Tijuana. Oh, nice. oh, nice, bro. Nice, nice. But I was gonna, but man, because you said something about Spain earlier, I was just curious. Like, how? What's the like the the government of Spain? What's their like look on UFOs? Do they ever release stuff? 
No, but there are many authors that have studied the phenomenon for many decades. I was talking about J.J. Benitez, but there's also a Jesuit uh, parapsychologist, uh, Salvador Freshedo. He's actually one of the first people in, in the 20th century who talked about us being a farm for these non-human intelligences. And he was always against, uh, he, he knew everything that was going on over here in the U.S. government. I don't know how, but his books are very revealing, and those are from the 60s and 70s, so I'd check him out. I wasn't sure if I was going to read that guy until you said the 60s and 70s, and that's very wild for that time. No longer with us, obviously. No, I'll find those. I'll find that material. I'm Puerto Rican, so I can read Spanish if it's only in Spanish. Hey, Astro, maybe that's our TV show, man. The Crash Retrieval Show. That actually would be a great Amazon project. It's, like, uh, right? it's like the Twister movie, <laughs> where they're like following yeah. Twisters and shit. <laughs> you never even see a UFO. It's just like them losing teammates to like the equipment. They try to press buttons and shit. Just splattered. You end up just researching like crop circles or something. It just ties back to something else. It's all just nuts, man. It always turns into a story of a broken arrow nuke. <laughs> Instead, like, you know, this reminds me in these woods of a 1967. There's so much untouched land that they can keep all that shit at and never tell anybody. And everybody agrees, like, just keep this here until we're done being pissed at each other. That, that Honestly, one of the reasons why I think we're not getting crash retrievals is that we've already developed enough technology to shoot them down. And that when they were actually crashing, we didn't have the capability to bring them down or like affect them at all. And so then they're like, oh, we've developed nuclear weapons. We've got these radar, you know, technology, you know, sonic weapons, uh, you know, all of this stuff that's being developed. There's even something that was released in the past couple of days about some of these, like, psychic, you know, weapons that we've sort of developed. And, you know, if we had that capability, I wouldn't imagine that if non-human intelligence was smarter than us, more aware of what's going on, that they would even come close to being able to be taken down anymore. Yeah, I think, I think you want to get fun. I think we keep a lot of them in Japan. I think uh, if you really look at the history of what we did there since World War II, Good or bad, we stuck out there a long time during interactions with Foo Fighters. A lot of crazy shit happened. Um, we pretty much owned that land. So even during, I don't know how long, when did we give them all the land? Their full independence. We even helped build their new constitution. And then the, the, the disputed lands and the islands between them and Russia from the, that war a long time ago is still not touched and highly secured by several nations, like as a treaty. And, um, I always think, like, that's, a, that's, a, that's the best place to keep in Japan. And all the islands they have off of it, and how much we work with them, and how they've tripled their defense budget in the last few years just to secure their islands. And It's a fantastic place to assume there's a UFO spot. You keep crash retrieval of that. They don't have to be here. And think of how many Marines chill in Japan. I know there's other reasons. I'm just being fun for it, but it's a very secure, secure area. Yeah, I just posted up above. Uh, Jason Sands just posted that he talked with Grush, who said there's eighty, there's eighty whistleblowers, not forty. So double, double it up, bro. That's a union. I can start the whistleblowers union. I mean, if you listen to some people who have been coming in and saying, talking about this UAP task force forum, which is basically a forum of thousands of people who are either previous government employees, I see people currently working in some of these programs, like they're sharing all this information. So I don't know, I, I would figure that there, if there's really this program like that, that there's a lot of people that are behind the scenes, you know, looking to come out and at least talk about it. I think they just have to vet their interests. Like, if, if the Grush, Grush seems genuine. And honestly, the way he was on Rogan, I, I think it, it was very, 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 like, he was all, not all over the place, but, like, 
pragmatic and the people he was bringing up in the names there seemed to be no interest and so they just have to confirm that there's zero interest in, in the reason they're whistleblowing that's that's what takes time you have to investigate every single person in contact with that individual and make sure there's no they're not a useful idiot which is a real concept within this subject which is being noticed now you have a call so, no i had a uh, i had bronchitis so i'm just taking my breathing easy you were talking earlier about uh, listening to voices, and I was like, this doesn't sound like him. No, I, I literally gave myself bronchitis by taking Mucinex too early in a cold. And uh, I haven't had bronchitis since I was like 20. Sucks, I'm sorry, that's rough. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still working, I'm in, the, I'm in my garage working out technically, so I'm just sound like very white on helium. Like a up. I'm just kidding. Uh, that Jason Sands tweet was, like, uh, pretty cool. Uh, he's being very uh, open today, don't you think? Active, yeah, for sure. I always appreciate that. Well, uh, Arthur made a post earlier speculating on uh, the situation with Sands, and Sands simply replied was correct. Um, which, I mean, <laughs> it was one word, but it said a lot. I mean, you would figure that, like, if you're looking at controlled disclosure, catastrophic disclosure, somebody is, uh, you know, supposed to act accordingly and and be part of that, and they go and sort of let the community <laughs> be a little bit transparent and let everybody know, uh, you know, what they're planning to talk about, but more in a more direct way. Uh, you know, that might upset some people. I'm thinking you, well, you, you already work with uh, Ross and, and Mr. Sable. Uh, I know you're curious, so I want to ask you. He was in the Reddit AMA and said something brief about Sands, but do you know if he interviewed Sands or asked him questions about his, uh, his experiences? No, I don't believe they've communicated directly. Um, I'm not sure about that. I could find out, though, the next time I talk with Ross. I mean, it would be interesting to get another interview and to get some more information. Even another space, I think, would be good. You know, I, I don't think Jason's one and done. I think we're not done from hearing from him. And even from up until the, the James Fox documentary, I feel like he's been active enough with his Twitter where we we could probably see possibly another space. I don't know. I think that's what the community would like to kind of flush out some of the things that he said. Um, I think it would be really good to, to have other whistleblowers too come out. Like, I, I don't think the whole thing with Jason coming out is all about Jason, but more of a shift that's happening and like people getting frustrated with these official means like arrow and being like, damn, like we're not going to get, the answers through arrow so maybe we should just go to the community and see what they can dig up and what's already out there and just giving the information straight to the public um you know i think that 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 to me was the the bigger thing that happened of less about like all about jason sands and his testimony because he just said there's 80 more whistleblowers so there's 79 more uh, that Grush has spoke to that are probably paying attention to what's happening in the in the scope of all of this and and probably looking for ways to reveal their information. They're just kind of like seeing what maybe the best method is. Is it going to need to know? Is it going straight to X spaces? Is it going through a documentary? Like they're prob a lot of these people are probably like gauging right now like what the best way is so that you know maybe they're not uh, trolled or like they put out all their personal information where people can look them up and like harass them, but they want to get their information out in a very respectable and credible way. I think that's the main reason doing it on Twitter spaces may not be a very good idea because I think Twitter spaces have a lot of potential and I think they will become something great eventually. But I think it's a uh, new media that it's in its infancy right now. And the fact that so many people can just uh, look you up and start asking you questions and maybe harassing you on your account that should be a major turn off to anybody thinking about doing it on twitter spaces again uh but I, i'm guessing that new efforts should come forward in terms of twitter spaces 
some more organized um, effort uh, with people who are like professional interviewers and they can run town halls or debate teams uh, properly without uh, leaving much room for interruptions. That would be a good start to maybe professionalize Twitter spaces a little bit more, don't you think? Oh yeah, for sure. That's one of the reasons why I like holding the and promoting the UFO Twitter week is to sort of elevate the conversation above, you know, some of the community drama that takes place and more focus on the topics and the current events that are that are happening and being able to have experts, insiders, uh, researchers in spaces really diving into these topics so that new people, uh, people who are just getting involved in the topic and come in and really learn about what's going on. I think that's important. And um, yeah, I mean, I wrote an article, my not this last article I released today, but I released an article on basically like, in my opinion, it was sort of like this decline in Twitter, UFO, UFO Twitter spaces, where it's become a lot of like community bickering and opinions about other people. And, you know, a lot of the stuff within the community of like these beefs that are taking place and under the umbrella of the UFO topic. And I think people are really getting frustrated when they're coming into spaces and they're just, honestly, they're just hearing bullshit. It's just dumb, dumb shit, dumb people arguing. And, um, when, when really what we need is people discussing, debating and, and really, uh, you know, going through a lot of these topics and, and the elevation of discussion to where we're actually talking about the phenomenon itself. So yeah, I feel that frustration. Elections, how's it going? What's up, man? What's up, Astro? What's up, everybody? Uh, great comment, by the way. I really liked what you just said. Um, regarding 80 whistleblowers, um, that, that number wouldn't surprise me a bit. I think the, my guess is that those folks are trying to make sure they have proper legal you know, representation before they really start popping off about what they know. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but that would be my guess. And from what I understand, Sheehan is being very, very careful about who he takes on that's new. He's got a lot on his plate. So maybe they can't find anybody with really good, you know, good representation to make sure they can get through the process without getting, you know, slammed against the rocks. Everybody, good to see everybody. Have a great night. By the way, Astro, can I ask you? Uh, I mean, I know... Uh, Sam sounded really um, believable when and when that whole six-hour space happened. But this tweet specifically, um, how can we confirm this the case, or is there any way to do so? Because it is new information. It is, and it is important. So, do you have any way? I think you can confirm when people are accused of lying and then you start seeing that they weren't lying and you can start to say, okay, well, this guy's so far so good. Keep it in that box. He might be wrong, but <laughs> that's how you confirm it. You start using discernment and that's what I'm seeing out of Sands. I think one thing that might, you know, work well for them in a kind of an expedited method would be to make sure that they go directly to Congress because if Congress is believing what they have to say, it probably will give them at least a modicum of protection and maybe they could come forward sooner rather than later. I think with the specific claim of the 80 whistleblowers, it would be just to ask Grush. Like, um, unfortunately, he uh, had to drop out of the SALT conference but that would have been a perfect opportunity when or if they opened it up to audience questions to be like hey we just heard that there's 80 whistleblowers instead of 40 can you comment on that and i think this like that to me whether or not like either side of it i think not holding people accountable but kind of like getting to the bottom of some of this information whether it's chris mellon it's david grush it's sean kirkpatrick like asking them the tough questions or the questions that are you know, on people's minds and then getting an answer that, uh, that kind of gets more information 
and more data and, and clarity to the situation. So I, I, to my, my answer would be just somehow ask rush, you know, that question directly. How can we do that? That would be great if we had a chance to ask him, but how? I would have said in the, like I said, in the salt conference, but I think now, like, I, I, I just don't know. Uh, I, there's Grush seems to be a very difficult, like it's, he's not like Jason Sands where you can maybe tweet out and get a response. Uh, it seems to be a lot more difficult to get direct answers from him and that there are only a few opportunities where the audience is able to directly ask him a question, which would be able to find that information out. I mean, what would you expect him to say more than, yeah, that number is pretty accurate based on the people that I've talked to? Yeah, for that one, I, that's what I would expect. I, I, I would expect something like that of like, yeah, there's more than 40, you know, like maybe less than 100, more than 40. But there's there's quite a bit out there because I would imagine he since then of the 40 come out, there might have been even more people that have approached him personally and been like, hey, I've, I've seen what you've done the past year. Like I, it's inspired me to come out and and to to come out so it, it doesn't even have to be these official methods or even previously it could be people who have approached him from just seeing his you know dedication to to coming out and through this process that have been inspired to to then you know kind of look for now a way to come out the, the good news is it definitely appears that the uh the dam is definitely giving way and people are coming forward and that that's a great you know that's good there's nothing wrong with that You up here, Paul? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, all good. Go ahead, dude. I know you've been trying to get up. I don't know if uh, you've got a thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I'll just be real quick. I, I, I do think when it comes to these numbers of whistleblowers that Jason Sands is, is putting out, that he very well might be referring to maybe a different group of whistleblowers as opposed to someone like David Grush. I think there's still a bit of a discrepancy there from what I've gathered. I believe Sam stated that he. And, oh, is Matthew talking? I can't hear him. No, he's down, listener. Oh, okay, I saw a speaker. Uh, but um, David or Dave, Jason Sam said he spoke to David Rush, like just spoke to him before he tweeted that. So, um, uh, I mean, I feel like he was providing some inspiration to Sands, but it also is related to the community. So it's got a little bit more. Um, well, that that could actually explain the, the that could explain the the number of eighty then that it's like a a group of about forty that he knows of and a group of forty that Grush is referring to because I have heard that it yeah that there are different numbers being thrown around. Uh, the tweet specifically says I just spoke to David Grush and he said I was one of eighty plus, not forty. Okay. What's up, Arthur? Uh, that was actually coming to your tweet. So, uh, wait, yeah. yeah. So, I feel I feel special that uh, he responded. Uh, I'm a big uh, Sans fan, so I'm pro Sans. Um, and I think it's important to distinguish between witnesses and whistleblowers. Um, I think witnesses is a much broader term that can incorporate a lot of different people, uh, not necessarily um, uh, whistleblowers. And, and I, I think it's a much more neutral term, and I like it better than whistleblower. Um, so, and, and I think he, he, I think Rush said that he he interviewed forty witnesses. I think that was his his terminology as well. You're correct. Yep. Yeah, witnesses doesn't always insinuate that they are actually able to um, get through the whole process. But uh, Grush interviewed a lot of people, and he got a lot of testimonies. I feel like Sands is uh, unique as that 80 number because he was actually able to speak to Congress. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's weird just seeing, like, uh, it, once you know his story, and then you see how um, Kirkpatrick's group had helped, dealt with it, like, saying, well... It, you know, it's nothing to be found. But after hearing him speak and how, like, uh, his experience, he he definitely believes the experience that he's sharing. And so, uh, and he also has a very long history with the military. So it's just very interesting to me um, how, how many others like him were just 
disregarded or brushed under the rug uh, simply on the grounds that uh, the story was, it was a story. There was no evidence. And I, I feel yeah, that's by design. call them believers, right? 80 believers. Yeah, 80 They're believers. <laughs> Uh, go for it. Elections and then Paul. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, you know, from, from my money, if we had 10, 20 serious people to stand up that had something to say of a grush, you know, Elizondo, Ilk, I mean, good God, that would change everything. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that uh, one of the issues that we're facing right now is trying to get these really legitimate people together into a position where they, where they feel safe coming out. And I do think that uh, uh, the, the Jason Sand space, as great as it was, also posed some difficulties and demonstrated some problems uh, you know, that are going to arise when you come out via Twitter. And uh, so then I'll just add that, you know, I, I've heard different... Uh, different numbers from different groups of witnesses, whistleblowers, whatever you want to call it, people uh, within the programs that, you know, are, were supposedly supposed to come out. There's kind of like the, the Stephen Greer group, where I also heard a similar number of about 40 uh, from from somebody who, who might be in the know. And then I've heard that, you know, we, you know we've all heard that number from David Grush and and then from some people associated with Dave and San with 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 Jason Sands, so uh, I just think that there's a, a little bit of confusion when it comes to these different factions. Yeah, there are different factions, but and I think Jason said that he uh, talked to Greer and he worked with Grush. Uh, he was part of the the UAPTF as part of that um, R space. So you know, the UAPTF wasn't just those three full time employees. It was a group of many intelligence agents that were quote unquote borrowed. So I, I think um, uh, Sands was claiming that he was one of those people. Definitely think he was part of that our space, but yeah, much beyond that, I'm still a little, little bit foggy on it all. But he does seem sincere to me, as as others have said. So I um I accessed uh sorry my dog just barked at my baby. <laughs> uh, he jumped on me. He's like a giant drum shepherd. Just wait, just put him on the drum. Uh, but uh, so uh, let's scare the crap out of me. Um. Let's see. Oh, I accessed the disclosure archives, um, and uh, Jason Sands was a witness report in his archives. Talking about Greer? Yeah, Greer's archives. I was like, literally, uh, I put, put a post in the nest about uh, Hangar 1. Uh, I had gotten that uh, information by typing into the disclosure archives, Jason Sands, and I brought up Jason Sands' testimony. Um, redacted, of course, but I recognized it. And then um, facilities and applications. Yeah, see, that's the thing. You know, I, I've talked to people associated with Greer. I, I can't say who, but, um, I mean, just look at what's happening right now with Michael Herrera. It seems like uh, Greer has a little bit of different standards, to put it uh, to put it nicely, when it comes to whistleblowers and so forth. Yeah, I'm looking at the discussion that you and Duff are having about the hangar and that being the Ross Colhart <laughs> spaceship. That's pretty crazy. That um, document that I was just referring to, the one with the, the locations, map locations and names, uh, there's notes on a lot of them that say there was a craft here. An alien autopsy was done here. Uh, it's like crazy. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot, I'm trying to figure out how to upload the PDF to my phone because every screenshot I have is really crappy. But I will be adding it soon. Yeah, you have to upload it as a JPEG. You can't upload PDFs, but... Where's the hangar listed? Did they say where? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, in West... No, no, no. Hangar 1 in Mountain View, California. So is this hangar... Oh. What, so real quick, was this hangar at S4 or Area 51 around there? What's that? No, that's in California. The, no, the the hangar you're referring to is uh, 
the one that that documentary is named after. What is it? Hangar, hangar. So, 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 somebody jump in here. It's it's a it's a it's a well known Area Fifty One hangar. But no, I, I think uh, Tip is referring to someone else, uh, something else. Okay, thank you for clarifying. H hangar eighteen. That's what it was. Hangar eighteen is, I think, what you were uh, thinking of. Um, I will send you the um that document I'm looking at, Sarah. It, no, it's yeah, California. So Area Fifty One. Well, I can't remember S four. Is that? Yep. Well, yeah, it's S4, and then there's Hangar 18, which is this supposedly, uh, you know, famous hangar. But that's that's over in Nevada. Different different place. What's the document from, Tiff? This is from Greer's archive? Like, wh how do you access that right now? Um. Well, I went to his Disclosure 2.0 event in June, so I already had a login to his Disclosure archive. So once he uh, uh, released it to the public... Uh, I didn't have to wait to register for an account, um, since I already had one. Cool, thank you for finding that. I'm going to have a look at this archive, uh, Tiff, because uh, I realized that it was released like a handful of days ago, and I just found out about it this morning. Um, would you say that there are some neat things to read, and this kind of like corroborates some of the other things we have here in the public for a while? Um, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of unique documents. Uh, he does have a section dedicated to whistleblowers. He has a dedication, uh, you know, photos and videos dedicated section. So there is, um, I see a lot of information I haven't come across before, and I've come across a lot of information. So uh, at this time, I am thankful for it. But uh, whether it has a lot of value so far, I've made value out of it uh, in just an instant, in like one look through. So I will continue, and I hope that everybody logs in and checks it out, because it's pretty pretty neat. It's easy to dismiss Greer, I get it, but the amount of testimony and just documentation that he has put together is pretty significant, and yeah, I bet there's just tons and tons of stuff there that for anybody that really wants to dig in and look deep. Yeah, and the archive from the press club event that he had that he said like it was a couple like bunch of terabytes big. Is that what he's talking about? Um, I think so. I, it's it's something new. He uh, released an entire archive database of uh, testimony and do photos and documents and yeah. Okay, that's probably it. Yeah, he's yeah, continually, continually adding information to his website and his his you know archive and library. I mean, he, he hadn't stopped after the first event. It's valuable information, and, and I don't dis dismiss anybody out of hand, much less Greer. I think there is a ton of, of valuable information in there. You just have to take into account the differences and the standards uh, between you know these different parties that we're talking about. I think it's easy to, to conflate them. Well, Greer has like the business. The Go ahead, Jimbo. Well, there's either witnesses or there's not, and... Uh... Greer's openly gathering people, so yeah, like, they're not directly tied to his credibility. It could just be separate data points that are just sending him information because they think he's the person to send it to, and vice versa. I think there's people from Greer that are feeding other so-called whistleblowers uh, information, such as Michael Herrera, uh, directly or indirectly. I'm not saying Greer is 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 feeding Herrera information, but people involved with him, we know, we now know are. So I just think that that's demonstrative of this kind of um, back channel sort of uh, inside baseball that's taking place. And so we just need to take that into account, not not to dismiss it, just take it into account. I think by and large Greer's interviews and the documentation is of a pretty high level. I mean, the implication, Paul, that I'm getting, and maybe I'm wrong, is you're kind of saying it's less credible than other stuff that's out there? No, I'm not saying that. Okay, fair enough. Um, I got a question. Um, Astro, you, you made a post uh, a while back about Jason Sands and how you were getting uh, DMs from people telling you not to talk about Jason Sands, and I'm wondering if you could kind of elaborate more on that. Thank you. No, I, I created that post. <laughs> I uh, That was just a joke post. I was getting direct messages about people's opinions on Jason Sands and it almost was like in their opinions they were trying to like influence my opinion um so that was one thing that was kind of annoying but uh the one where I was like the whistle the gatekeepers 
are getting the text of like, don't talk to Jason Sands was basically a lot of what Jason has been hinting at is that this, the, 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 there's like a group of controlled disclosure, uh, that are upset with him because of the method of which he came out. And so like, they just wanted him to wait until James Fox documentary, and then he can go take his rounds on the podcast and do his media tour. And I think that if you look back specifically at the space that he came up in, people were speculating about what Jason was going to talk about and about his credibility. And so if you were listening to that and you were him, you would want to come up and like write the record and be like, yo guys, like you're talking shit on my name. Like that's not correct. And I think it just boiled over to where he even said he was listening into spaces, but he sort of came up and tried to write the record and it became this, historic sort of event and um i think that then he sort of afterwards like in the heat of the moment it was a great experience and i think for the community it was really sort of motivating to what could be but i think afterwards the feedback that he probably got from a lot of people was like bro you shouldn't have done that like you should sort of go back to this controlled disclosure and i think that's what i was hinting at in that um you know a lot of people weren't saying anything like the week after it was weird because nobody was commenting on it like none of the big shows news nation didn't cover like nobody covered it and i think a lot of it was because people were like oh like i'm not now you like you ruined your opportunity to do this big media rollout because you went in a twitter space and it was sort of like the ramifications of what he did it sort of hurt his media big time rollout from this control disclosure group What's funny though is I feel that once the movie comes out, it's it's nothing back to change. square one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he'll be he'll be back on the podcast circuit and all that stuff. They're punishing him right now for not following the rules. But can I push back fine, against that? Can I push back against that tiny a tiny tiny bit? Sure. Um, so I I don't know if I I, I fully agree with the uh, with that stance that you know that because he didn't play by the rules that he's getting kind of slapped on the wrist i do think that there is some of that for sure and i think that if anyone wants to get a good picture of the jason sand situation uh from sort of behind the scenes check out uh vinny adams from disclosure team go to disclosure team check out their most recent interview with courtney marcassani and uh and she basically lays out the entire situation uh from her perspective and how it wasn't just that well, it, it was like you say, Astral, that uh, you know people in spaces were uh, sharing his information and, and kind of getting it wrong, and and so it boiled over. But it was boiling over for months and months prior to that. It, his story came out on Spaced Out Radio, and that was honestly where a lot of this kind of centers upon. Which I, I don't know if everyone realizes this is that Spaced Out Radio is kind of the epicenter of of the Jason Sands situation, which. Courtney, uh, you know, uh, helps out with, and I'm a huge fan of Courtney, by the way, so, uh, <laughs> nothing against her, uh, Courtney, <laughs> Courtney and I know each other and, uh, yeah, love Courtney. But anyway, I think, um, it's not just that he didn't, uh, you know, toe the line for this kind of controlled disclosure. I think it, it was a, a little bit also that, uh, he maybe received some pushback from, you know, the, the, people that he was already in contact with, like clearly Eric Davis was skeptical of him for better or worse, not saying I, I agree with Davis, uh, and, and others that, that he was in contact with other, other journalists and documentarians like James Fox and so forth. So I, you know, that, that field is, you know, that field of journalism is incredibly competitive. So, so there is some, oh, of that, I would, I, I would uh, imagine Leslie clean is probably involved in that somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I agree. And, uh, so that, that was part of it, but I, I also think, that, so yeah, I think some of these people maybe, um, were just a little unsure of, of how to back him or whether to back him. And so that combined with, uh, his story coming out through spaced out radio and a couple other outlets kind of boiled over, like you say, and then into Twitter and, um, yeah, I just I think it's a little bit more complicated than simply he came out on Twitter and therefore you know the the gatekeepers are 
are angry at him. I, I think it's a little more complicated. I think there was some some behind the scenes kind of uh, stuff going on as well. No, that's a good point. Definitely, Pavel. What's up? Yeah, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask uh, because you're saying that this group of control disclosure didn't like it, but um, and I get the sense that Ross is not very close to that. Uh, but I thought he was. I don't know if you know about this is, is ross part of this control disclosure group or is he just on his own doing his thing with news well, the whole idea of close uh, of a uh, control disclosure i think is is very much conjecture it's still it's to be debated so uh, i think it's maybe it's overly simplistic to even ask that question in that way no no offense oh ross is definitely definitely part of that inner circle I mean, you read his book, I mean, he's, he's all about Podesta and all of that. So, yeah, there's this inner circle of ufology, you know, um, Green Street talks about it. I mean, it's pretty obvious. A lot of power and control, like a serious amount of power and control within ufology. And they have, you know, hundreds of, you know, people here on Twitter, they're in like secret, you know, uh, you know, discords or signal chats. They're like getting insider info and they come on Twitter and act like they're all like super macho and they know more than everyone else. And it's, it's narrative control. And that's a big thing that Jason exposed because when he went public, and everyone was trying to figuring out whether they should back him or not. And they were waiting to hear from you know, XYZ celebrity to tell them, yes, it's okay to support Jason Sands, and they were all silent. So it caused massive confusion. Yeah, but is it so wrong for people that, that are at that high level, the inner circle, so to speak, to want to have a, a, a long kind of vetting process take place and to know that you can fully trust them? But they vetted Sands for well over a year. I mean, he was part of the UAPTF. I mean, he knew Grush. It was obvious that he was he was you know liked, respected, and you know you know coveted as a you know a, an important whistleblower by all these people with the inner circle, and he basically said, "Screw you guys all," and I'm doing my own thing. Yeah, but according to Davis, Eric Davis's public statement, it wasn't you know it was because they they didn't feel they could trust him. According to Eric Davis, his public statement, his story changed from moment to moment, and he. Couldn't kind of keep track of it all, and, and frankly, from what I've you know just gleaned from Jason Sands, I wouldn't blame someone like Eric Davis for feeling that way. Well, even Danny Sheehan mentions it, and uh, I think Courtney yeah. mentions mentions it too. Of like, Danny Sheehan said he wouldn't take advice, and then Courtney's like, "Well, we were talking like personally about his plan, and then she got blindsided by him, and you know, like she was getting contacted, like, "Hey, your boy's out in the space," and she's like. Nah. And so I think it's probably just like a pattern of, you know, some of these whistleblowers probably don't want to go along with this plan of like, hey, man, you can't talk about this. You can only do this this certain way. Like you have to like not come straight out to the public. You have to like do these like media things and like stay silent for a little bit. You know, some of these guys are probably like, fuck that, man. Like I want to come out and tell my story. So the 80 whistleblowers, 40 whistleblowers that David Grush talked about, they probably have acknowledged that, like, look, we can't control all these guys. We don't have the ability to do that. So we're going to be able to have to, like, we're going to have some collateral damage of people coming out and telling their story. Then, you know, we're just going to have to deal with that. I think that's that's the main thing that I took is, like, there's no controlled way to, like, have all of these people come out because they're, like, dudes who want to tell their story and get and get the information out. There's some people who are just driven to do that and don't want to be, like, this in this spotlight or be on these podcasts and have their face all over the place because they've seen what happened to Grush, and now they're seeing what happened to Jason Sands, you know, and, like, all of the criticism. Yeah, they made Sands an example. They made an example out of Sands, and that was, if you don't follow us, you are going to be destroyed. Literally, uh, I, 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 I think people are rightfully skeptical of him. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, Astral, but I, I don't know if Sands is... Uh, I, I don't think it's as black and white as that. Sorry. Oh, I agree, yeah. Hey, Paul, uh, did you well, know... I, dis I disagree, but you know, it's only because I trust my own judgment. The best way I could vet somebody like that is to just listen to him speak for six hours. 
And anybody that look can't that, make a judgment on whether he's times. telling the truth after speaking for six hours is fucking brain dead, including you, Paul. Oh, found. Okay, well, that, that's just <laughs> insulting. That oh, we don't need to go there, theory. Larry. Calm down. Uh, Jimbo's talking. I don't know if you can hear him, Larry, but go ahead, Jimbo. Well, I heard him, but he cut right in on me. Well, you, you jumped in the conversation. <laughs> go ahead, Jimbo. It's all good. Mr. Larry, after Jimbo, you jumped in. Just a point. If this was all just what you're talking about, Paul, you wouldn't have a fake law firm posted from his WhatsApp belittling him about not taking proper uh, lawyer advice and then Danny Sheehan jumping onto a podcast to say, yeah, I'm not connected to him because he doesn't take our advice properly. See, that's what's happening. That's what the history is. And you, and you see the reaction. Uh, you do see people pushing a certain agenda. And from what I've watched over the last year or two, I see that the, his testimony is different from the certain accepted norms of the agenda. Don't bring up uh, things like abductions or anything like that. But... What's his experience? His experience is sort of like an abduction. And People bring up abductions all the time. What are, what are you talking about? So. He's, he, yeah. I didn't hear Grush bring him up. Did he bring that up? Uh, no, 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 he didn't. He said he hasn't heard anything from the 40 whistleblowers on Tucker. He said that, which is strange. <laughs> Yeah, but other people associated with the so-called controlled disclosure do bring up the abductions. I, I agree that there does seem to be some suppression of that element, but uh, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, they are overstating it slightly. I agree with the first part about that that suspicious website. Clearly, there is some some fuckery going on when it comes to Jason Sands, but um, I, I think that maybe you're actually interpret interpreting what I'm saying a little more. Uh, black and white than, than I'm trying to state it. I, I do think that there there is some 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 of what you y'all are talking about going on. I definitely do. I just think it's more complicated than that. Go ahead, Bob. I got him up at co-host. What's up, Science? Yeah, so I just want to point out to people that uh, Jason uh, is active in a program requiring to have a security clearance and uh there's a lot of grumping going on about him having not gotten dots or approval to talk. He said he did get dots or approval to talk. I, I, th that's that's new to me, and if it's right, I, I'm, then I'm wrong. But I'm he telling, you what, the, post, I'm telling right? you what the complaints, the complaints I heard were that he was that he didn't. If he did, great. And if that's true, that's a legitimate complaint. These are the types of things that need to be elucidated. And it's probably specifics that to say you have the approval, there's probably specifics there which you can every follow. every single sentence you intend to utter, every fact, everything has to be approved one by one. Well, he made several tweets about that, how he did get Dosper approval, and he even said that Dosper approved him to talk about crash retrieval. Yeah, but he said a lot of things that, and that have not been verified yet, so for people to jump to the, these various conclusions, I think, is still a bit premature. And, and if that is the case, that he didn't get the full approval, then couldn't you see why folks like Danny Sheehan, who are trying to represent him, could be frustrated with that? I can see why Sheehan... Well, I guess I you're calling him a liar, and I would say he's not a liar. I mean, but I you don't see, you don't know that. I can see why Sheehan would be upset if he said things that were outside of the scope of his DOPS or approval, because that exposes him to um, re, uh, official retribution. Yeah, litigation for sure. Go ahead, Larry. I saw you had your hand up. Something. All right. Well, arguments aside, here, here's a theory that I that I'm considering. I wonder if you think it might be right that he wanted to talk about his experience as well. And that I think James Fox wanted to cut that part out. And so I think the reason he came forward is, and the reason I think this is because that experience was, was the thing that really touched him, you know, emotionally. And so it's, it's an important part of his story. 
you think that might be why he decided to come out in public in spaces and because James was going to cut that part out? I'll just say, I don't know that that's a good theory, but uh, what, what makes you think that, Larry? Actually, it's based on Arthur's, you know, uh, he responded to Arthur's tweet, right? Did you guys talk about that earlier? I don't know. I yeah, know. a little bit, yep. Yeah, so it seems to me that, I, I'm not sure which part he was just saying you're correct about, because there was like a multi-part. The whole know. thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But it was, yeah, I see what you're saying, like how much credibility was each of those questions really when you dig more into it? I think the reason why they like things to not be impromptu and organized and things like that are just simply uh, because of the amount of information that Jason was allowed to put out uh, and all the details that he was allowed to put out. Based off the uh, report when he spoke with Greer, what he was reporting to Greer was solely the things he was hearing on the communications, that there is crash retrieval programs, and he was even invited to go uh, into this retrieval uh, situation or whatever, but he didn't like what uh, they were already, you know, having him do. Uh, it's on the Disclosure Archive to search Jason Sand's name, and uh, it shows what his whistleblower report was. It didn't talk about blue aliens. It was that he feels that there's uh, people are mishandling contraband, and he was hearing it, and uh, they're denying that this exists, but he knows that the way they were speaking, uh, in his professional opinion, they are mishandling contraband. It does seem like two different things, though, his experience and then his experience in the quote-unquote program. And I, it, it is a good thing to bring up, Larry. I think it is interesting in that maybe in the James Sox documentary, a lot of the focus, and that this would also point to like the NDA maybe stuff that he would have signed, was that about the program, and he wasn't really allowed to talk about the capacity or the information that he received while in this program um, of surveillance and listening to a lot of the stuff. But he's, uh, you know, allowed to go into um, and, and free to talk about his experience that he's had uh, that's personal to him, which would make sense that it was much more powerful in uh, in his involvement in, in the topic. Yeah, I feel like he came in as an experiencer and spoke like an ex experiencer that time. Uh, it was not his professional, the, like normal, what he would be re uh, presenting to Congress. I think he was in an experiencer mode. Um, but for for <laughs> I see that uh, you joined us. Uh, go ahead, and then all things. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that um, I really feel deep down in my heart that uh, all of these things are a combination of sleep paralysis, and I know you've heard that a lot if you join these spaces, um, but sleep paralysis is Gotta real. Drop him, drop him down, man. Yeah, no, that's and. Oh, dude, I work for NASA. What? Hold up. I want to hear this. Yeah, I, I have had sleep paralysis. I, I know that's a phenomenal experience. Go ahead, Bird. Wait, who said drop him down? Don't worry about it. Keep going. Okay. Um, and uh, military technology that you won't hear about for 30 years. Otherwise, I promise you we would know about it. And by we, I mean all of us. Um, but sleep paralysis is very, very, very real to the person experiencing it. It's 100% real. If you have experienced it, you know. And uh, I know uh, that it's also genetic. And the first time I realized that it had a name, it wasn't just a bad dream, I asked my dad, because I learned it was genetic, I asked my dad if he also had it. And he thought he had been abducted by aliens. And he realized that day that he hadn't. And I think that's what a lot of us are going through, man. Like, military technology is so far ahead of what we know as regular humans, I promise you. I you know this to be true. Like time beings instead of aliens? 
Hold up. This is this is the sta- the bog standard boilerplate ex- boilerplate explanation for all sure. personal because explanations. Right. Because you know, right. okay, maybe you believe that, but how would you explain shared sleep paralysis encounters where multiple people encounter the same entity, for instance? How would you sh- how would you explain shared visitations? Of, well, okay. Uh, so, I mean, I can try. Um, Go for it. I'm interested. For me, I, I uh, wanna, everybody everybody find... sees the man in the hat, right? I've seen yep. it myself. Yeah, I did too. Um, but I also stayed awake until I got out of sleep paralysis. And it became uh, my dresser with my Buddha statue on top of it. Okay, but answer my question about shared experiences. Uh, that it's, and it's physical... physical it's not stories, it's people that actually have shared experiences. Yeah, but I mean, if you're expecting a man in a hat, you see him. I didn't see him until I heard of him. Well, I, let, 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 me, I. let me add let me add a couple of comments. So uh, on your specifically first on your shared experiences things, you need to read John Mack's book. He has oh, found, I have. Okay, then then you know he found multiple experiencers who had shared experiences that never met each other, and he found out they had had the same thing, same thing at the same time. And John Mack did not believe that all abductions were sleep paralysis. And I'll oh, accept Bob. his word before yours. Wait, Bob, you're t- I think you're you, yeah, you're talking to me. Yeah, yeah, you're talking to the wrong person. Yeah. Uh, I'm in total. Yeah. I'm, wait, Bob, I'm this in is total. Going, no, this I'm, is talking, really I'm, good talking I'm talking to I'm talking to Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, Ferd. You can uh, uh, make your point, and then we'll throw it around to the room. I think this is a great discussion, by the way. I, I already made my point. Like, I, I totally believe that because I just I think we would know I, I'm, if if actual aliens from out outside of our universe fucking appeared. I believe we would know. I know we would know. I would know. How, do you, how could you possibly know that? That's I work absurd. For NASA. Okay, so that means that you automatically know things that no, are no, on the well, cutting edge. Sometimes, edit? sometimes I know things slightly sometimes. before you. Do you think that there could be instead of contact coming from ex- an extraterrestrial sense that it could be more based in interdimensional or like yeah. states of consciousness where I we know, have yes, yes, and, yes, and yeah. I think I think that explains the the commonality between the dreams, honestly. Calling um, dreams is just diminishing. Do you guys not see how insulting this is to experience? That's not it? insulting, bro. I'm not insulting. I think you're, Paul, I think you're just, you're, you're going hard on this. Thing, bro. <laughs> I, I am going a little hard. I am. I'm not insulting you. I promise you, man. If you've had those dreams, if you know what I'm talking about, then uh, I'm sorry. You're calling it a dream. I've had physical <laughs> results from this. Oh, you've been. I didn't know you. Okay, whatever. But well, um, no. Uh, I've had physical <laughs> results from these things. I've had shared experiences. I know yeah. multiple other people have had shared experiences. You haven't re- re- responded to any of that adequately. Oh, well, what I was going to say is, like, uh, well, obviously, we don't understand consciousness at all. But we have uh, understood it to the point that um, we know that there are some species of, I guess you can call them animal, maybe insect, that have a shared consciousness. We can understand that because... That's the brains we can understand, but um, I believe we do too. Um, it's I, I've just seen it. I know it's true, just because of reality. Because um, so many times I've come up with a new idea, and immediately it it came true. We're yeah, talking about like the, well, the Jungian archetypes, Carl Jung, that, that whole concept of the collective unconscious. When I say shared experiences, I mean two people in the same room, same bed, having the same experience with the same entity, often oh. with physical results. How can um, you possibly explain that? Um, one of them is a liar. Okay, well then you're just deferring to everyone's either lying or mistaken, which again is All the right, boiler. Let's, let's move on. Boiler. I don't, wanna, don't want this to be a little argument. Okay, well, I think it's a good debate. I'll shut up, bro. It's all good, man. Um, all things, uh, and then we'll go to uh, Mr. Nobody. 
Hey, thanks. I just want to address FERD real quick and address Larry real quick. So with FERD, there's no doubt that sleep paralysis accounts for a certain percentage of the phenomenon. But of course, it's ludicrous to say that it counts as 100% of the phenomenon. Um, and as far as NASA goes, you know, you're talking about the group that basically lost the most important uh, yeah. original tapes in the history of mankind, right? So I wouldn't put too much uh, weight on working for NASA in terms of, uh, you know, trustworthiness. It also doesn't explain sleep paralysis. A case like Travis Walton, who literally went missing, his friends were about to be indicted on murder. Th this clearly is a case of not sleep paralysis, right? So sleep paralysis definitely accounts for some percentage, but certainly not 100%. And as far as Larry, Larry, I, I totally agree with you. It's definitely possible that um, they're only going to portray part of Jason Sands' story, but this is not unusual. If you look, this happens quite often. Sometimes we don't even realize it with experiencers like Bob Salas, for example. They just put out the most palatable parts of their stories that fits the narrative of the movie or the documentary. So, you know, if you watch Bob Salas' story, you only see the strict military base encounter. But he himself has told about being abducted by aliens and having some experiments done on them. And so they're just not going to put that in the documentaries and the TV shows on History Channel and that sort of thing. So it actually happens quite often. I'm not saying that's the case with Jason Sands and, and Fox, but it wouldn't surprise me. Thanks for chiming in on that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just think that there's still some stigma. Like, if James is trying to establish the existence of the program, which I really applaud, I think that's a great target. But if, if he mixes up an experiencer, uh, and, and Jason is an enigma because he's both, he's both a sort of a whistleblower and an experiencer. And that's like, well, and that, that's just like begging skeptics to say, well, w wait a minute now. Is this guy just some kind of lo loony tunes who, you know, they're going to... So I could imagine them cutting the experiencer part out. I'd like to send it over to the world's premier paranormal researcher, Mr. Nobody. Yep. Mr. Nobody, you're up. Here we go. I was observing the moon just a while ago, dude, and something's beating the shit out of the moon. It's just bouncing around. You know, <laughs> the big laser will come We're out. We're just going to have a space full of nonsense this now. Rocket ship. This thing was huge rocket ship. <laughs> oh, laser, whatever it was. Dude, and then all at once the moon disappeared, and then it reappeared in a different spot. Now, how in the No way. Oh, my God. Between this and between the, the gaslighter who has no followers from a couple months ago, you know, it, this is this is devolving into an unintelligible kind. All right. Thanks, Paul. But mm, I actually kind of want to hear this. Mr. Nobody, uh, give us an update on the moon. I'm uh, fixing a drink right now, so I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. This is not some super serious space, by the way. Uh, we're, we're just casually talking about topics. Well, I was at uh, this place, this mountain, and I saw the Rebora lights on Friday night, dude. This was not, this was, I don't know, something was weird about it. I mean, and then I'm, I'm observing the moon, you know, and the moon's bouncing around. Now, I've seen this before where it's bouncing around, something's beating the shit out of it, and then all at once a rocket ship comes out or a laser comes out of the moon. This is a war going on, so if everybody starts looking at that moon or filming it with uh, night vision goggles, you're going to see some shit. It's going down. The war is happening, okay? And I've been watching this war for a long time. Laser beams on, you know, on Earth and everything. So, But uh, the Rebora lights were amazing Friday night, really. I saw it in person. First time I've seen it.
It's called Aurora Borealis. Yeah, I don't give a fuck what you call it. I call it what I call If I call you a bitch... Uh, obviously you, you don't. You call it the Borora Lights. I just say it's fucking light. It was pretty as shit, though, right? The moon is a machine. That was nice. Yeah, it was nice. I didn't get any pictures, so I feel left out. So I don't want to hear about it, damn it. Uh, uh, screen, what's <laughs> over? More like the Barora lights, too, though, I gotta say. Get them Barora lights were good, but the moon's getting beat to shit. Those damn Barora's is... Man, that sucks, Astro, that you didn't get uh, any pics of it. I, uh, it only came like as far down as Columbia, so I didn't get to see it down here. But, um, yeah, I, uh, who was it, Ferd? Um, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't say everything is sleep paralysis, but I understand what he's saying. Uh, it does seem that it, most of it is altered states and then uh, orbs that, you know, kind of put people in altered states. Um, just, you know, I had a, uh, a dream where I was saving people from a crashed airplane in the ocean and, uh, I banged up my knee in the dream while I was saving people. And when I woke up, my knee was swollen. Uh, that, that doesn't mean I was abducted by an airplane. So it's like, uh, you know, I, I've had the experiences. I also put in the work. I also do the research, right? And, uh, you do keep coming back to consciousness and, these altered states, and that is a big elephant in the room, it, because, uh, you know, a lot of people in the community are borderline cuckoo, myself included, like, uh, you know, I'm willing to jump off the deep end, and uh, it's, it's a big thing that's not talked about, um, but there is a cool, like, gray area where, like, uh, the subjective and the objective are kind of uh, indistinguishable, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, like, totally. Like the shared experience part that Paul was talking about, you know, you can uh, argue with genetics, sympathetic resonance, if you're both in proximity to the orb, you know, I always bring up Fatima. People were seeing the Virgin Mary, thousands of people, right? In the pictures, it's just ionized plasma. Like, they have the actual photos and videos from that when people are saying, oh, I see Virgin Mary. But guess what? It wasn't the Virgin Mary. So it's like, uh, that's that's a huge thing that just, like, goes untalked about because uh, people think it's insulting or, you know, they think it's mean or whatever else. Well, you know, I think it's insulting when that side of the argument isn't given enough time just because it doesn't fit people's biases. Um, so, you know, maybe it's not sleep paralysis, you know, like I said, uh, altered states though, most definitely. And I think, uh, more people should look into that as well as like the occult and, uh, alchemy, things of that nature. It really gives a lot of the answers that people are looking for. Nice redirect, bro. I like that. Bob, go ahead and then we'll, uh, throw it down to Arthur. Uh, uh no, Arthur was before me. Cool. No, you're close and you can jump in whenever, Bob, by the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, so I posted another spicy tweet that Jason made today, basically um, asking um, Eric Davis to meet him in a skiff in Washington, D.C. So I, I think there, there's some sort of big beef going on between Eric Davis and Jason Sands. I'm wondering if anyone has any insight. Maybe Science Bob knows more. Uh I do not know what that beef is about, but like the, both of our recent people that have hopped out of, out from behind the covers and started talking in public, Steve and Jason, um, I've had four people inside who ought to know that they are real and ha are credentialed and so forth. So I wanted to bring up a couple of things um, that somewhat supports uh, some of the things that Ferd was saying, not all of it, but there's some of it. And uh, it's recently, John Alexander went on a podcast. And in that podcast, he used words and made claims that I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the people that were listening to it would not understand what he was talking about and not understand the import. And I wanted to make sure this group knew about it. John got on and told that he was heavily involved, of course, way back in the days when people were doing remote viewing and other things in DIA, etc. Uh, 
in a program where they learned how to do neuro-linguistic programming and could induce altered states, screen memories, and other things in, at will in people. And so uh, this is recent, and I, I'll tell you what, I cannot believe John Alexander said all that in public. I'm going to find it and put it up here. Was it the I'll, Sean Ryan one that he was just on? Uh, it was not the Sean Ryan one, or I would have remembered, because, I mean, I watch everything Sean Ryan does. That guy's got a great podcast. Even though his politics and mine are on the opposite side of the planet, I still think he is a great podcaster. Yeah, I know John was on that one recently, too. He, he was, but that's, that's not it. It was one I was not expecting, and had it not popped up as recommended on X, I wouldn't have noticed it. I mean, it just popped into my thread, and I clicked on it and went, whoa, I can't believe John said this. So others might want to look while I try to look for it 